169 prisoners are being brought for trial to this court in the city of London, the Old Bailey. Their finding of the Old Bailey car bomb that killed one man and caused 178 casualties. But I'm enormously grateful to the jury. Sensational developments from the phone hacking trial. The judge here. made his ruling today. Huntley shook and turned pale. The third IRA suspect to be acquitted of terrorist charges here in a year. The sentence of the court is one of life imprisonment. I mean, please take the defendant down the sentence. The Old Bailey is the home of British justice. Its walls have formed the theatre to our greatest national dramas. To Oscar Wilde, George Blake and Christine Keeler. To Sutcliffe, Huntley and Warboys. The IRA and Al-Qaeda. Through the rows of metal detectors, up a marble staircase, past statues of long forgotten judges, in a crowded wood panelled back room, all day long, a team of court reporters dart between hearings. They work to file the reports that go out to newspaper offices across the country. No transcripts exist in British courts. They are not televised. Without court reporters, justice is not only blind, it is mute. And there are vanishingly few court reporters left. Court News is the last specialist agency to operate from the Old Bailey. They've been here since 1985. In their vaults lie first-hand accounts of every major case of the age. I'm Gavin Haynes. In this series, we're going to be going inside British trials, through the eyes of those who see justice being done every single day. The Court News team. So far, this series hasn't mentioned murder, which may seem a bit odd given how much of it there is about. Every week, the 18 courts of the Old Bailey will have at least three or four murders on the go, most of them covered at least passingly by Court News UK's reporters, who often file two or three pieces a day. Murder fills pages in newspapers, even when it isn't telling us anything new. The endless gangland machete killings that often pass through trial within a week follow a clear set formula. So too do most family killings and that other key genre, brawls that got out of hand. Court news reporters come with copper bottom stomachs as standard. But they are human too, so occasionally they rub up against a trial that gets to them. And often this isn't because of the gore of the case involved, or even the tragedy of the life lost. It's a case that hits different, one that clangs with the uncanny. Sitting in the back of a murder trial, sometimes you meet a case that bears witness to what's rotten in the human condition itself. A glimpse into a world that isn't merely awful, but foul too. And whenever such a case does come along, Guy Toyn tends to go down and see it for himself. Guy is the co-owner of Court News UK, and he's an avid murder enthusiast. Right now, he's writing a book that trawls the Court News archives for the most unsettling cases of the last 40 years. Well, I don't think I'm I'm interested in, in the ultimate depravity of people, just because they are depraved. What I mean by that is I don't think that the more violent and the more excessive people are necessarily makes a murder case more interesting. Uh, Sometimes the incredibly mundane can be really, really interesting. But obviously, I suppose someone who does uh, fry the brains of his victim on on the hob does have a little bit more fascination than something else, than someone just, like, I don't know, two blokes killing each other uh, in a bed sit or something like that. The thing is, is we're all fascinated by murder, really, and people who try and deny this are just uh, living in cloud cuckoo (laughs) cuckoo land. They really are. We've got the case of a gang of, of Turkish gangsters who murdered a DJ. Um, they tortured him to death, held his girlfriend in a cupboard for a couple of days. Uh, she escaped. We've also done the case of the guy who wanted rid of his wife. So he killed her, stabbed her to death then set fire to the body. Unfortunately, when he was setting fire to the body, he also set his beard on fire. 
but he managed to get out of the house with his 17-year-old son. Then, when it came to the court case, of course, the only thing that he could do was blame it all on the 17-year-old. He'll be serving a life sentence as well. Uh, then there's the woman who was held in a cupboard for a number of days and uh, fed only on sachets of tomato ketchup. This autumn, there was one murder that really stuck with him. One of the perks of running the company is covering what you want to. This one, Guy insisted on reporting in person. And one day, in the very first week of the trial, he took me with him. Most of the time, Guy tends to walk around the court news offices as though he's dressed for a park run. Acrylic shorts, bright t-shirts, trainers. Often, the trainers are removed and he pads around in his athletic socks. But when he does have business in the courts down the hall, he returns to a shelf on one side of the company's musty, dishevelled office, wherein he keeps some black slacks, which go over the shorts, and a black polo neck, which is pulled over his t-shirt. Having disguised himself as a court reporter, the pair of us headed towards Court 15, where we walked in midway through a series of witness accounts, which were being boshed through in short order. These were background moments on the whole, small events, not crucial ones, but facts that built towards establishing the timeline. The policeman who discovered the body, for instance, and the man from the local off-licence who served the victim most days and statements read out to the court, detailing her last contacts with various neighbours. If you stood up as you entered or left the court, you could see into the dock. In it sat two figures. Farther off, a woman, very fat. Closer, a man, titchy and pale. Jack Spratt and Mrs Spratt. These were the alleged killers of Susan Hawkey, a former bank clerk, Hawkey was 71 years old when she was found dead in her flat in Neasden, North London. The woman, Mrs Spratt, was Chelsea Grant, 28 years old. Zaire Howard, the man next to her, was only 23. As these trivial details poured endlessly from the witness box, both stared blankly into the mid-distance. Psychologists sometimes talk of folie à deux, the madness of two, the magnetism between a pair, that leads them to commit crimes much greater than they would individually be capable of. It's not clear whether this was a genuine folie à deux, but it had a wanton feeling, a lack of clear intent. In the gradual weeks-long slip-slide towards depravity, there was a sense of the gravitational force of two personalities acting on each other. The more of the details of the trial we absorbed, the more the question raised itself before us. Why did any of this happen? It was a grim, maddening quality that Guy Toyne had already picked up on. I think this case is interesting because it involves a couple, a couple who were certainly spurring each other on to a certain extent. Also, we're always, our sympathies are always with the most vulnerable in society. And uh, in this case, you certainly got that. I mean, Mrs. Hawkey basically was barely able to defend herself. She was barely able to look after herself. Uh, We heard in the court that her flat was full of rubbish. She spent most of her time shuffling down to the shops with a shopping trolley, just buying booze for herself. This poor woman happens to come across or be come across by these two people who can really only be described as urban savages. That's exactly what they are. They, They just basically had no compunction on preying on this woman. Hawkey was something of a familiar figure in that patch of Neasden a dreary suburb of northwest London, not far from Wembley. She had worked as a bank clerk, but retired. Her husband died, and, somewhere in all that, she had turned to the bottle. That day in court, her neighbours had said that she always went round in the same clothes, a red duffel coat and brown Ugg boots, lugging a granny-style wheeled shopping bag. At least one account read into the record mentioned that her personal hygiene was, quote, not the best. Her newsagent testified to the list of things she'd buy every day. Cheap wine and frozen dinners. The policeman who found her body took the stand. He described being alerted by neighbours to a foul smell. He spoke of the congested, unkempt state of her home. Newspapers, furniture, bric-a-brac, rubbish all piled up everywhere. 
And what was it like when you moved through to the bedroom? The prosecution asked. Even worse, he said. The short version, then, of who Susan Hawkey was, was that she was five foot two and clearly vulnerable. An easy mark. One day, in late July 2022, she began to tell her neighbours an odd story, that she'd been robbed in the street. Mrs Hawkey was quite a well-known figure locally. She was well-known for the red duffel coat and the shopping trolley. And Howard and Grant lived two minutes away, and they'd obviously seen her a couple of times. The first muggings, they just pulled the, the bag off her shoulder. But that was only where things started. Three weeks later, Mrs Hawkey was going around saying she'd been mugged again, by the same people. And this time she'd been knocked to the ground. After the second mugging, Zaire Howard managed to find out how much money was on her bank card. He bragged to a contact on Instagram, Yo, I copped a card, bro. 16k is on this ting. 16k was clearly a lot of money to him, and this changed the game. As he saw it, the money was there. They just had to liberate it. Now, he thought laterally. They had Mrs. Hawkey's bag. The bag contained her house keys. They knew where she lived. So, they decided to pay her a visit. They simply opened her front door and pinned her to a chair. But Mrs. Hawkey was made of tougher stuff. Despite their threats, she refused to give up the pin code. The threats got worse and apparently Howard stole a bunch of stuff. But in the end, they had to admit defeat. Still, Howard seems to have stewed over the cash. In this narrow ledge of his life, at least, he wouldn't accept failure. Somehow, Mrs. Hawkey hadn't changed the locks. And that set the scene for one final confrontation. And this time, when Howard went back to the house, he decided that he was going to get not only the bank card, the new bank card, but the PIN number as well. How he did that is, of course, a matter of conjecture, but certainly he has gone in for some sort of either psychological torture or perhaps sexual torture. Who was at that house on the second occasion, as we'll soon see, was central to the case that followed. What's clear is that after the second visit, the neighbours heard no more tales. On September 26th of 2022, Susan Hawkey was found by police at her flat. She was dead. Long dead. A policeman had been summoned by the flat opposite, about the smell. Once the door was smashed, he quickly traced that smell to the body in the bedroom. But no one yet suspected foul play. For someone as determinedly alone as her, in poor condition, death at 71 in her own bed seemed logical enough and the police didn't immediately suspect foul play. The body was decomposed, after all, and even a brown shoelace found somewhere around the neck area didn't immediately tip them off. In fact, it was only a couple of weeks later that someone realised that Susan Hawkey's debit card was still pinging all over town. The police found that the card had been used at a McDonald's in Wembley on a fairly regular basis. So they went to the McDonald's to uh, see what CCTV they could get of them, them using the card. And as they were coming out of the McDonald's, they looked across the road and they saw them, Grant and Howard, just sitting at the bus stop. And that's when they were arrested. They were arrested there and then. And Grant had Mrs. Uh, Hawkey's bank card in a pocket and £1,600 in cash. So they saw them? Yeah. The police saw them? Yeah. And how did they know it was there? Well, because they basically, obviously, they, they, they had a descriptions of them, they had CCTV from other places, oh. so they knew what they looked like. And you can imagine these two coppers being in McDonald's and then one going to the other, uh, excuse me, mate, I think that's them over the other side of the road. And that's exactly what happened. And they were both nicked there and then. <sighs> Both Chelsea Grant and Zaire Howard were visa overstayers. Both were from the small Caribbean island of the Grenadines, which is administered as a territory alongside the nearby island of St Vincent. The largest island of the Grenadines is only seven square miles. The capital city is 25,000 people. Yet, despite hailing from this speck in the ocean, Grant and Howard had never met before they turned up in London in early 2022. 
They'd been introduced to each other at the house of a mutual friend. She was five years older, but that very same night they'd had sex. And since that moment, they'd seemed inseparable. By the time of their arrest, Grant was also pregnant with Howard's child. So it was a love story? Well, I don't really think it was a love story, more of a lust story, perhaps. Uh, We heard in the court case that apparently Howard needed to have sex at least twice a day. Perhaps it was something to do with that. Perhaps it was some sort of gratuitous physical obsession. Who knows? Um, They used to spend most of their time arguing, throwing things at each other, being thrown out of different flats because Grant would always argue with the landlord about how much rent she had to pay. It was a fairly itinerant lifestyle, to to say the least. I don't think, uh, really, it's the sort of love story that would make much in the the pages of Byron or Tennyson. But, um, I don't know, Maybe, maybe they did love each other. They didn't seem to have much love for each other in the dock, of course. When they arrived in the dock of Court 15 in September of 2023, neither seemed to want to look at the other. Nick Forbes also reported the story for Court News. He remembers them as blank and bored. They didn't really respond to anything. They just sat there and like looked on. And that's often the way with you know people in the dock. They have this slightly like removed look about them. Why do you think they have a slightly removed look about them? I think maybe by the time they get to this point where they're on trial, they've already been through the court and similar proceedings for months, maybe years sometimes. So they're like experts at it, if you like. And perhaps they've been heavily briefed by their legal teams not to do anything that might like show them in a bad light, uh, especially when, when there's a jury uh, present. So I think it's probably a bit of, bit of both. So despite being very young, they're also very experienced at this sort of being processed mm-hmm. experience uh, you know, in the courts. Annabel Darlow, KC, was prosecuting. She laid out the Crown's contentions to the jury. Firstly, that Susan Hawkey was strangled during an attack motivated purely by greed and self-interest, as she said. Miss Hawkey, Darlow went on, had been tied up, with both her hands tied together, her eyes had been taped shut, and a ligature knotted around her neck. Her body was found under a duvet and had been decomposing for some time after her death. The suspects, Darlow went on, were boyfriend and girlfriend and lived in a flat a short walk away from Miss Hawkey. At some stage during the summer of 2022, they had clearly spotted Miss Hawkey and recognised in her an ideal victim. Jurors were told that Miss Hawkey cancelled her stolen card each time and that she'd threatened to thrash them with a hammer if they broke into her home again. But somehow, Grant and Howard had extracted the pin to her bank card, though Hawkey had committed it to memory. So how exactly, Darlow asked the jury, could that pin have come out? Only if she was the victim of considerable violence and aggression, she concluded. Darlow laid out the case by playing the jury the vast archive of CCTV the pair had built up by walking around Westfield, White City. They basically visited a whole load of like high fashion branded shops and just just bought loads of random stuff. There was CCTV footage shown to the court of them going in and buying jewellery from a jeweller's shop, going to like a shoe shop and buying like Timberland boots. Um, I think another thing they bought was, um, you know, bits and bobs of clothing, toiletries, perfumes from a perfume shop, um, as well as like stuff to eat from little sort of sandwich shops and things. So it was like this kind of almost like what you imagine a child might do if they went to a shopping centre with an unlimited budget and just bought all this stuff like on on impulse, it seemed. Uh, And by the end of this, they could be seen on on the camera footage, literally with bags bulging in both hands with with all the stuff they just bought. And so that that was really uh, a telling moment because it was like, is is all this criminality they they just did, did it all just lead to that? Did it just lead to like a shopping blowout that took a few hours? And that felt kind of sad to me. Howard and Grant managed to tear through £13,000 of the initial 16 k in places like Poundland, TK Maxx, Primark and Sports Direct. In Primark, Grant took a picture of himself in the change room mirrors, clutching his shopping bags, looking fly in his new cheap clothing. At John Lewis in Westfield, they bought £240 worth of perfumes. Immediately after, they headed to Timberland to scoop up some £180 worth of shoes. 
On the same trip, they blew through H&M to Clark's and Adidas. Between times, the magic card was used to summon taxis to hop on local buses in Wembley. They bought many, many hamburgers. Once, they drew a few hundred quid from an off-licence cash point. Did you observe any kind of dynamic between the couple in that footage? I think it was mainly Zaire who was doing the buying. So it was, he was at the counter buying the stuff and his partner was there with, with the bags, like almost piled up around her feet. So it seemed like he was maybe taking the lead on, on actually using the card and, and doing the transactions. But these are quite generic bits of footage, often with like Dutch angles at them with, with interesting sort of perspectives. So um, it wasn't entirely clear from that exactly who was in control of, of the situation. They had her money, they were spending it. So what, Annabel Darlow asked the jury, was Mrs. Hawkey doing? Neither of them had bothered to call an ambulance and both of them were more than happy to spend her money um, as she lay dead. So really, from that point onwards, it was just a case of how the two defendants would actually counter, if you like, the welter of accusations against them. What they relied on was the most tried and tested, if ineffective, method in English law, the cutthroat defence. In a case like this, there's only one defence which can be employed by either of these defendants, and that's a cutthroat defence. They're going to have to blame each other. Grant simply asserted that she'd never been inside Hawkey's house. And therefore, well, the only time that she went to the house was when Howard made her have a sniff outside to see if she could detect the odour of the dead body. So, therefore, the only killer could be Howard. For his part, Zaire Howard turned it round. He said that they'd both been inside, but that he had slipped out. And it was then, he said, within that brief interval when he was gone, that she must have killed Mrs Hawkey. Howard, alternatively, has said that he went back to their flat, told Grant that he tied up Mrs Hawkey, explained to her how he tied her up, and then Grant went back to the house to re-tie up Mrs Hawkey because she wasn't somehow secure enough. Of course, this is, again, slightly fantastic. But what Howard has done there, of course, is give her, Grant, the window opportunity to strangle Mrs Hawkey to death. His case is that when he came out of the house, having bound her wrists together, she was perfectly alive, talkative, no harm had really come to her. In total, they both faced eight counts each. On the charge of the initial robbery, they both pled not guilty. Then, on the second charge of the street robbery, Howard pled guilty. On the first break-in, they both pled not guilty. And on the final count of robbery, again, they pled not guilty. There were three more charges which related to using the bank cards. And then, of course, a charge of murder, which they both denied. With their quite separate stories, each also had their own lawyer. Sometimes in a cutthroat defence, you have a little bit of tetchiness between the two barristers. In this case, there was a bit of a few cross words between the two barristers in the case. Uh, Melanie Simpson uh, was representing Grant and uh, David Hislop was representing Howard. I don't think they liked each other very much, to be quite honest with you. The credit card had placed Grant and Howard in the vicinity of Hawkey, but another piece of evidence appears to place them both inside the flat. And that would contradict Grant's story, at the very least. It would also add an extra layer of the macabre to any theory of what had gone down inside there. The condom was found near to the body of Mrs Hawkey, and it had the DNA of Howard, Grant, and Mrs. Hawkey on it. So how did it get there and how was the DNA deposited? We had a scientist called in the prosecution case who said that it was possible that Mrs. Hawkey's DNA had got onto the condom because flies on her body had then landed on the condom and deposited, deposited it there. 
extraordinary, really, and uh, completely unlikely. But of course, given that it was Howard Seaman in the condom, there can only be one other explanation, you may think, as to how the DNA got on the condom. And of course, this now makes out Howard not only to be a mugger, a robber, a burglar, but also a rapist. Alone, old, pitiable, defenceless. Susan Hawkey's final six weeks, from the first mugging on July 27, to her ultimate death around the start of September, were undoubtedly nightmarish. In the prosecution, Annabel Darlow could only gesture towards the kinds of things that might have gone down in the house. We'll never know the full story. We'll never truly know quite how long Grant and Howard might have detained her for, or what exactly either of them did to her. But what's also true is that at no point in the timeline is there any evidence that they showed her even a sliver of humanity. With little to lose and a cutthroat defence to enact, each now decided to stand up their quite different stories by testifying in their own defence, and in effect, against each other. Chelsea Grant was first up. She told the court that she had wanted to come to the UK to join the Royal Navy. Unfortunately, she was too fat to uh, pass any fitness test. She spent most of her time in the dock trying to blame Howard for what happened, largely by saying that Howard was violent to her, threatened her, um, and all this sort of nonsense, uh, none of which is likely to be true, since you can see uh, on the CCTV when they're together how easily they work together, how easily they use the car together. Uh, Her case, of course, was that she'd never been to the house at all. Her only difficulty was that she had to explain why she was caught on CCTV outside the house one day. And she said what in fact had happened was that Howard had told her to go down to the house and see if she could sniff the scent of, of the dead body decomposing inside. She said that Howard had confessed to her that he had tied up Mrs. Hawkey to get the pin number and um, that she basically, although she had been involved in one of the robberies of the victim, she was completely innocent of anything to do uh, with the murder whatsoever because she simply wasn't there. She doesn't come across as a thoroughly stupid wicked individual, she comes across as a fairly ordinary person, certainly not inarticulate. Some of her explanations, of course, are so fantastic they could barely be believed. But she never came across as a sort of woman who'd been lured into a life of crime or deluded or was easily malleable. She just came across as an ordinary person and quite why she got involved in this, um, again, it's difficult to understand. Unfortunately, Zaire Howard didn't come across nearly so crisply. He was shifty, evasive, monosyllabic. Remember that a brown bootlace had been found near Mrs. Hawkey's decomposed neck. Annabel Darlow told the jury that this was the ligature, the murder weapon and that when he was arrested, Howard had been wearing brown boots, with one lace missing. He also had one thing which some people do have when uh, they lie, which is known as a tell, where they make a gesture or they have some sort of body language which signifies when they're lying. And I think that's true in Howard's case, because every time he lied, he'd sort of do this strange thing where he licked his lips. Of course, given that most of the account in the uh, witness box was a complete lie anyway, he did spend quite uh, some time licking his lips, but um, he was thoroughly unbelievable. I think he came over as a much nastier character uh, than Grant did, to be quite honest with you. Worse was to come. Once the Crown introduced their search histories, 
what was left of the pair's story disintegrated. If you ask a police officer about the way most cases are solved, and he actually agrees to answer your question, he'll tell you that defendants, unfortunately, are invariably stupid. That's what makes them criminals. And in this case, it's absolutely true. By September 19th of 2022, Grant had begun making Google searches on her phone for decomposition scent, how long does a dead body smell, and how do neighbours smell dead bodies through entire walls from outside and in other houses, and is a dead body a very strong smell? Nick Forbes was there that day. They used Google a lot and they kept on Googling the same thing again and again. It was very unstructured and they were Googling it all hours of day and night. I think basically it seems like they went in fits and starts. They got panicked at times and there was a flurry of Googles at like one in the morning about how to stop you know, the smell of decomposing body leaking through the walls of a flat. Uh, or they suddenly, you could see their thought processes as well. You could see them suddenly Googling gas masks you know, or, or biohazard suits. And they, they sort of investigated buying various kind of protective equipment that might enable them to presumably not suffer from the smell of this body is a big giveaway. Yeah, it was quite a damning moment when they read through those Google searches. Both of them were doing it, uh, as, as I say, at various points over the sort of days following the murder. One of the most banal yet unbelievable facts about modern crime is how many cases turn on one of two things. Cell phone mass data to pin down location and time. And then Google search histories. Easily requisitioned by detectives from mobile phone providers and broadband companies. A few months back, for instance, Nick saw a case of a man involved in planning terrorist offences. In the days leading up to his arrest, he spent apparently quite a long time Googling how to convert a dummy firearm into a live firearm. So he, he bought these air pistols, basically, uh, these, these replica weapons, and he was Googling methods for, for converting them, what materials you'd use. He was doing searches on YouTube uh, for like instructional videos on how to do it. Um, I think he even like found an academic paper about how to convert firearms made in Turkey, which these guns were, into live firearms. And he downloaded that as well. Uh, and all of that evidence was a key part of the case against him. When it came to that point, Grant simply claimed that Howard had been using her phone. And here lay a bigger issue about the power dynamics of their relationship. Who was really in charge here? Was Howard, as the man, the natural killer? Or was he led by her, or led to impress her in this grubby way? After all, of the two, only Grant had previous convictions for violence. Back in the Grenadines, she'd got into a fight with another woman over an Amazon parcel. It had been misdelivered to her house. Grant had decided to keep it, and when the rightful owner had rung her doorbell, she'd beaten her up. Grant had also stolen a laptop from the care home where she worked illegally. But then, it was Zaire Howard who was smoking psychotic quantities of marijuana. Did that curdle his mood? You've got to remember, this is a guy who is a huge cannabis addict. We heard in the court case, they kept all their roaches in a great big tub. And if he didn't have a drawer or didn't have any fresh cannabis, he'd go through the tub and pull all the roaches apart and put those in a joint. He, he was that sort of person. And he, obviously, he, to get more drugs, he would have needed to have the cash. And he wouldn't be able to get, have any access to the cash without the PIN number. So I think also that he wanted to get the PIN number so they could buy a lot more you know, high-end value stuff. I think he also wanted to get the PIN number to impress Grant more than anything else. Um, so he could come back and they could go on a spending spree and she could buy her perfumes from John Lewis and all the little bits of tat she wanted from TK Maxx. I think it really was on that level. In short, there was a world of evidence to point at both of them. With separate stories, the case simply came down to one's word against the others. And in a cutthroat defence, as Guy often says, you end up drowning in each other's blood. On the 25th of October, 2023, after two full days of deliberation, the jury returned with a verdict. 
Zaire Howard was found guilty of murder. But on that charge, Chelsea Grant was found not guilty. The jury had done its duty, only in so doing, they'd left one massive paradox unresolved. The verdict's an interesting one in this case because the jury have refused to accept Grant's version of events. She said she never went to the house and yet they have convicted her of three charges of robbery. That means two muggings and the incident where the prosecution said they were both at the house. What actually happened at the house beyond the robbery? And of course, this brings us back to the condom again. I'm afraid we have to leave to the imagination. But the jury found, for whatever reason, that Grant was not guilty of the murder. The prosecution's case was it would have taken two people to restrain Mrs. Hawkey and that, that Howard tied her up while Grant held her down. It looks as though the prosecution may have lost this charge. However, who is to say the jury might have accepted that Grant held Mrs. Hawkey down, that Howard tied her up, and this was the robbery, and then Howard strangled Mrs. Hawkey, a murder in which Grant took no part whatsoever. Grant was not even convicted of the manslaughter, but she was at the house, which she had explicitly denied. I was slightly surprised by the verdict. I find it surprising that the jury thought that Grant could have been at the flat and yet taken no part in the murder whatsoever. However, that is the verdict of the jury, and of course, it is the verdict that we must accept. Nonetheless, it's an unhappy turn. An unhappy turn? Yeah. What's that, a miserable seabird? I'm sort of prompting you for more, really. I, I just feel like there's a sense that something, a sprocket pops off the great machine of justice this week. It's impossible to go behind a jury's verdict. You always must accept the verdict of a jury, and that is sacrosanct. And when a jury returns its verdict, that is the truth of the case that we have to respect. Both of these individuals were overstayers, they're effectively illegal migrants, they came yeah. here on short-term tourist visas and then just never left. Yeah. What responsibility does the British prison system have for their keep then, if Howard is going to be serving you know, a term of something like 30 years? That racks up, will that expense be transferred to the Grenadines ultimately? I'm not sure exactly how it works, but sometimes prisoners can be deported to serve their sentence in their country of origin. But what's more than likely is that they'll both serve their entire sentences in the UK and then will be uh, deported at the end. So I'm afraid their incarceration is gonna be at taxpayers' expense. Six weeks after the verdict, the court of Judge Judy Kahn was back in session for sentencing. It was now the 13th of December, 2023. I'd been up to see what was originally supposed to be the sentencing on the 8th of December, but that had turned out to be a pre-sentencing hearing. This was Judge Judy Kahn's first ever trial, and so, rather than sentence them on the spot, she'd decided she needed more time to think. The final date had been pushed back another week by which point I was already out of the country. So, immediately after the sentence was finally pronounced, I called up Guy Toyne. Well, in the end, uh, Harold was jailed for 31 years and Grant was jailed for 15 years. The judge accepted that Grant might not actually have been at the scene when Mrs. Hawkey was robbed on the last occasion. That is to say, when uh, she was murdered by Howard. The judge accepted the defence submission that what might have happened is that she might have encouraged Howard 
uh, from afar, if you will. Uh, strange, uh, but uh, there, there you go. The judge's reasoning was that if the jury believed that Grant was at the scene, they would have, by necessity, convicted her of at the very least manslaughter, which uh, I can't really see, but there you go. We also had some victim state impact statements from a cousin who I think were named anonymized, who said that uh, Susan was a very kind, generous, smart and hardworking person. And she said that when uh, Miss Hawkey had lost her job, I think she was um, quite a well-regarded bank clerk. When she lost that job, she basically became a little bit reclusive. She split up from a partner, then both her parents died. And um, as you're aware, she became a hoarder and lived in circumstances of some squalor surrounded by old newspapers and rubbish. And um, the family say now uh, they can't bear to imagine uh, what happened to her in her last moments. Um, Obviously, we'll never really know exactly what happened uh, in that room, whether Howard and Grant had sex in front of her, whether Howard pulled her clothes off, put the the, uh, tape around her eyes to sort of torture her, to make her uh, reveal the pin number. It's all uh, pretty sordid and desperate, to be quite honest with you. But I guess uh, Howard's got 31 years to um, have a think about what he's done. And really all for, you know, a few free McDonald's, a few free bus trips, you know, a few pairs of trainers from Sports Direct, 31 years. He was, so the minimum term he, he could have got was 30 years, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And Judge Judy gave him one more year for luck. Do you think that's fair yeah, or exactly, interesting? Yeah, exactly, effectively. Do I think that's what? Why 31 years? I suppose... The extra year is probably due to the fact that he uh, did nothing uh, to alert the authorities to the body rotting away and that he showed no remorse whatsoever. And that remorse is demonstrated by the fact that he used the card as much as he possibly could. It wasn't just a murder for gain. It was a plot that was played out over several weeks. You've taken a particular interest in this case. How did you feel in court yesterday when, as it concluded? When you see two people wasting their lives in this fashion, it's always slightly pathetic. It's always slightly sad. You almost wish that you were there six months ago, six months, I should say, before the murder, so you could get a hold of these two people and say, what are you doing? Because they've wasted their lives for 13 grand. It's really, really, really sad in the end for all the parties concerned. Did they react at all? No, they haven't reacted throughout the trial. It's almost as if they can't bear to look at each other. Grant and Howard now have a child together, one that may or may not have been conceived in Mrs Hawkey's flat. Neither will see day's light within the decade, and maybe that's for the better for the child, whose future does seem horrific. Whatever passion they began with, these were two people who met and through that meeting seemed to have unlocked a belated evil within each other. As I pointed out at the start of this episode, there is a certain kind of case at the Old Bailey that gets under your skin. Not because it's dark or grubby, as much as because it is so banal, so motiveless. And there's a certain kind of killer who seems to have as little respect for their own life as that of their victims. Even after the killing, they barely seemed to have bothered to cover their tracks. There was no get out. There was no great escape. Just two nihilists and a credit card, milling round the Wembley suburbs, waiting for life to catch up with them. 